On this blog I'm going to talk about health on a boat. You would think that life on a boat would be really healthy. It's active, you're out in the fresh air, you eat um, local food from local markets and when you're out there all the stresses of land just simply disappear. Well it may not be that simple. That we share is as deep as the sea No matter how rough things may come to be You and me, we're family Sing home, hey, long for the ride home Hey, I'll stay by your side home Hey, you'll always be Sometimes you can't get hold of fresh produce. Being active isn't always that easy and accidents can happen when the boat's rocking and rolling all over the place. So it's no surprise when accidents do happen. But if you need medical expertise, that is often far and few between. And of course, it's a fantastic community, the boating world, uh, but it doesn't really help it if you, know, you want to drink in moderation. Sometimes that, if it gets out of control, can also be a problem. What's that? It's emotionally expressive juice. <laughs> you think you're a man expressive? Yeah, I think um, I think life and flow is like being a manic depressive. You go high and low within within hours. So on our boat, we try to prevent getting ill or having accidents in the first place, and we do what probably a lot of people do is we try to eat a healthy, balanced diet: fruit and vegetables, whole grains. Um, try to avoid processed meat, things like that, and we try to have lots of herbs and spices that we pick up along the way and sometimes we go on an extreme health binge like um, this month which was a um, diet of no dairy, no gluten, no alcohol, no caffeine, um, no meat. Um, so we're kind of left with a vegan diet really which yeah it's pretty good for a month. Blueberries, banana, spirulina powder, apple juice, and soya milk. <laughs> we also try and stay active. Keeping active as well, even though we're moving about the boat a lot, we also do other things to try and stay active, which again, isn't always easy when you're an anchor, which is a lot of the time really. Everyone's got their own things they like doing. Woody likes uh, running. I like to do a bit of yoga. Ewan, he likes dancing. I like to keep fit by doing my aerial silks. And Darry would probably put sailing at the top of his list. Or kiting. They all like kiting. Or anything on wheels. Walking something we started doing um, a couple of years ago when Ewan was only five in Greece. Yeah, he kind of struggled a bit then, but slowly over time it's built up and now we're in Spain and the last two years we've been joining, I would call them more like hikes really, because they're a good um, between nine and 12 kilometers and four to five hours of constant walking. Um, and he's pretty good at that now. In fact, all of us quite enjoy that. As I said, really keeping fit, can be difficult. Uh, most of it normally, if we're underway, would be um, water-based. Yeah, so despite all of this, um, a first aid and medical kit is what you need on your boat, even if it's just a basic one. I would include painkillers, antihistamines, antibiotics, antiseptics, bandages, dressings and plasters, and triangular bandages as a minimum, really. On the website, I've put a PDF download to what the Maritime and Coastal Agency recommend for an offshore medical kit. We have quite a way to go before we are really fully equipped with our medical kits. It would be useful to learn how to use it as well. So first aid skills are also really important to have. We've completed many first aid courses over the years because we're both sailing instructors. It's good to keep up to date with it because some of the regulations on um, CPR, the compressions and breaths um, are changing constantly with new research, so stay up to date with that.
the one day RYA first aid courses focus on water and things that could happen around the water as well as other things. There's also a longer medical course you can do which is the MCA STCW Medical Care at Sea. It's a five day course and that will teach you more in depth um, methods of um, actually diagnosing problems and being able to kind of um, administer injections and treat patients for a bit for a longer period of time. One of the worst accidents I had at sea was mid-Atlantic when I cracked my ribs. It was my, partly my fault because um, I didn't put the lee cloth up and I was on the top bunk but um, luckily the skipper had done one of these courses and he knew that you know he couldn't administer morphine in this situation. Main accidents that I've seen or witnessed you know in my experience in the water um, have been near drowning and um, following on with hypothermia. So these kind of things can be um, learnt about and how to treat them and recognise them just from the one day first aid courses as well. Right, medical insurance. So I think a lot of people do have medical insurance and I guess this is probably quite important if you're travelling in places like um, the United States where um, most people have insurance there and I think medical treatment can be quite pricey. So far we haven't got medical insurance, uh, we've just been in Europe for two years and we've managed to get medical treatment along the way and it's been fairly affordable. If you go for an appointment in Spain for example in a private clinic you're looking at around 70 euros and emergency treatment is free for um, UK citizens. Well Gary and me was running across near the grass but I fell on the concrete and I was bursting out tears. Well, I vomited about four times. We were rushing back and he was sick, so then I realised we had to get to the hospital, so now we're at hospital for the night and monitoring him to make sure that he was OK. Um, so now I need my doctors and they're making sure it's all right and we need to stay here until the next morning without no water. So once in the morning I can have some water. In Turkey, which is not the EU, an appointment costs around 85 euros in a private clinic. Um, I also had to get a blood test at the hospital and it was a private hospital and they tried to charge a couple of hundred euros but um, the doctor I'd seen negotiated um, it for the local rate which was only about 25 euros. Um, we also had dental treatment in Spain. Uh, this is um, free for children and adults as well just for a checkup. but then you pay if you need an x-ray which is about 30 euros and if you want any kind of dental care you're looking at around 20 euros so actually it's fairly reasonable. As I mentioned I think one of the previous blogs we actually have got ourselves a dental kit so if we are away from land and um, away from anywhere that we can get any checkups we have actually got a bit of equipment that we could probably um, use. I'm taking behind dad's teeth. I'm getting off the brown bits and I'm getting the plaque off. And I'm taking the brown bit off and from between his teeth. So one of the things that maybe people don't consider as much is um, mental health aboard a boat. When you're living in close proximity as you do on a boat with your friends, family or guests then it's quite difficult to find your own space. This can put a strain on relationships if there's any disagreements where on land you might just take a step back, walk away, get a different perspective and this kind of diffuses the situation. On a boat you can't do that. This in itself can be frustrating and stressful. We just spent about two hours trying to get off the boat. It's like, well, first of all, we had to move the boat. We had to lift the anchor and move the boat into a more sheltered spot. Then we had to park it. Then we had to get the dinghy out, roll that up, get the new boards put in. We had to pull the outboard out of the lazarette, put that in. Then we had to tell the kids off several times because they started messing about with the pumps and all that sort of thing. Then we had to find the passports. Then we had to find the uh, cash cards. Then we had to find the cash. Then we had to lock the boat up. Then we had to lock the hatches. Then we had to sort this out. And, but it's really funny isn't it? It's hilarious. So other emotions can intensify as well. So for example when I cracked my ribs I felt more depressed than anything else. So I wasn't able to move and I couldn't do my watches so I didn't feel like I was contributing much and started to feel more of a burden than anything else. So the other thing is that everyone's different. Everyone's got different coping levels and this can change depending on the circumstances. I've done numerous yacht deliveries, three Atlantic crossings, I've skippered on flotillas and I've also instructed in our own sailing school. But I've never felt the same anxiety as when um, sometimes I feel when I'm sailing with the children. 
So I thought about all the possible triggers for me and then I thought it'd be quite interesting to find out if other women experience anxiety on their boats and what the reasons might be. Some women also mention things that help them with their anxiety so I thought all this stuff would be good to share because anything that helps us all stay out in the water and enjoy it can only be a good thing for everyone. So here we go. So what are the main triggers of anxiety on a boat that some women have talked about? The highest one on the list that got 75 votes was adverse weather. So most people said adverse weather and the unpredictability of thunderstorms and lightning strikes. So on a boat here you can't go home, shut the door to keep the rain and the storms out. Even when you are in a sheltered bay or a marina, you have to be um, alert to bad weather. Yeah, one of the things that makes me anxious is, um, I guess, sailing through lightning storms because I'm always terrified we're going to get hit. I think it's the unpredictability because, I mean, the lightning, I mean, obviously we've got the lightning rod, which is a mast, <clears throat> and it could start fires, um, but it's also, it can completely ruin the electrics on the boat. Warring and manoeuvring in a marina or town quay in close quarters this was second on the list. This got 39 votes. When I was a flotilla skipper, I noticed that people would often panic when they're coming in to moor up, which is understandable. Anything can change, a gust of wind, a line in the water. Not only that, but you're expected to squeeze in between all those precious boats and not touch them. I think the, the biggest fear is, um, is losing power, like losing either the engine or the bow thruster. But also there's a lot of lines. I mean, we have got prop wraps before in marinas because you just can't tell where the lines are. And if it's a badly managed marina, there could be lines and all sorts of stuff in the water. Most accidents do happen in marinas as well. Um, that's just because everything's packed in so close and uh, everybody's in close proximity. And that's where the expensive things happens as well. Because there's a lot of posh boats around here. Too much sail out and reefing got 34 votes. This is the point where life just can't carry on as normal. Everything has to be secured and even you if you're planning to make a cup of tea, lunch or even go to the loo. Someone suggested that dinghy sailing helps because you kind of get the idea of heeling over on a smaller manageable boat or um, if you're worried about going overboard because the heeling then clipping on and a few people mentioned they actually um, bought a catamaran which helped. Me personally, I actually still feel better when I'm on a hole, but I'm not going to get into that debate here. So anchor dragging, 16 votes. Again, most people go home knowing that their hard day's work is done, but um, when you're sailing and on anchor, you still have to be alert when you go to sleep at night. Most people use an anchor alarm or even two at a time. And also planning in the event that your anchor does drag. So if it did happen, you're not dealing with the unknown and you're not in crisis management mode. But again, prevention is even better. So finding a really good anchorage and putting out two anchors if necessary or more lines to secure yourself. So this brings me on to the next um, one, which is fears of other people's seamanship skills and their anchoring ability. And that got 10 votes. However careful you are, there's always a possibility that other boats are gonna drag and they're gonna possibly hit your boat. Engine failure, this gets eight votes. I guess the anxiety level will depend on where you are and what kind of help you could get, really. But could you drop the anchor where you are? Could you sail safely into a harbour? Can you actually fix it yourself? Well, we've had three engine failures. It's not been a mechanical failure as such. It's, it's always to be do, done with the fuel system. Uh, diesel, bug, or no fuel at all. And the, and the first and the worst was uh, in the Gibraltar Straits. Just to paint a picture, we took um, Carol's mum out, I, was in a, I think she was about 75 at the time and Carol's friend who was 75-ish at the time as well and coming to the point where we thought well we'll just go out for a little bit of a sail uh, and of course the weather conditions changed, got it slightly worse, we got some swell and anyone who doesn't know the Gibraltar Straits so you get a lot of currents and tide there. Conditions were getting rough so I said to Carol right let's put the engine on. So we put the sails away, put the engine on which had just been serviced going back towards uh, Queen's Key Marina for about two minutes and then the engine just died. It's just been serviced, couldn't understand the problem. It was being blown back out into the straits, into the sea and, and anyone's been in Gibraltar, there's lots of big tankers out there and stuff and, and ferries whizzing in, in and out or to add to the um, problem. Got the sails out again so Carol got some, some control over the yacht. She was trying to tack by herself and I was trying to sort out the fuel problem down below. 
I was on about an hour on my knees, bobbing up and down, trying to trying to fix it. And in my mind and in my heart, I thought, if I don't get this sorted soon, we're going to be in a position where we may have to call a mayday. Fixed it in the end, swallowed a bit of diesel, and we, we got back in. But at the time, and looking back, I thought, never again. Never, ever do want to do that, do that again. And so I learned to be about servicing diesel engines and doing my own checks. We had engine failure just as we were approaching the huge industrial harbour of Valletta in Malta. By the time we actually got to the entrance, under sail, it was already pitch dark and we were um, in the way of all the big tankers and super yachts that were trying to come out and there wasn't anywhere safe to anchor. So with our very slow approach we were effectively blocking the entrance. It was quite an anxious time for us. Anyway, in the end you please know that the pilot boat towed us out of the way. But now that we've experienced it, I don't think it would feel so bad next time. This is actually what other people said as well, that the unknown and the anticipation often feels worse, but once you've survived it, it feels better after. Captain Demice, that was um, a trigger for some people and that got six votes. This would be a terrible thing in any place really, but um, even worse if you're out at sea, there's no one to support you and you have to stay calm and sail your boat back to land on your own. Going up the mast, five votes. Um, I'm not particularly worried about heights, but I would be worried if the rigging failed. Uh, we try to prevent any of these fears by um, attaching a safety line as well, which is always good practice. Someone also added financial and money as an anxiety. I would also agree. It's one of those things that can cause anxiety on land, obviously, as well. But um, again, at sea, life is quite unpredictable and um, how much money you're going to need in different places at different times is also quite unpredictable. So again, it's the unknown, I think. Falling overboard, um, it became an anxiety for some people. This squall came through. I was really stressed actually because I don't mind strong winds and stuff, but I don't like that kind of thing. It takes you by surprise and it feels completely out of control. I was thinking about things that might break again. So, coming into Sicily, we've hit a bit of a storm. It wasn't forecast, so I don't know where it's come from. Um, screaming down these waves, uh, hit 10.7 at one point. I think there's probably procedures that can be put in place to manage this one, such as clipping on, not leaving the cockpit alone, never at night, keeping your centre of gravity low. I think I um, worry more about my kids and husband going overboard, um, especially if they're not following the rules, so the rules that we have for life jackets, harnesses, clipping on, and peeing over the side when we're underway. Menopausal symptoms also causes anxiety for some women. So you're not just adapting to your body, but while sailing you're having to adapt to many things as well as the symptoms that you're experiencing with menopause. It can't be easy. So loneliness and being away from friends and family also causes anxiety for some people. On a boat it is a fantastic community, but sometimes you, there can be um, stretches of time when you are um, away from people and you don't know when you're going to be reunited. Rigging failure, that didn't get many votes. I don't know why it crosses my mind. I think um, it's probably not that catastrophic as long as it doesn't hit anyone when it comes down and as long as you clear um, all the rigging from the water. It was only five years ago that we did uh, a two-week course which was novice today skipper and one of our instructors Lucy, she had a boat and um, she told us a story about it being demasted. They end up cutting up the rigging and the mast dropped in the water. So that's always been a worry and concern because you look at these shrouds and they still move and I know they're supposed to move a bit or maybe more than that but yeah demasting is a big issue uh, or, or mentally for me. Uh, we've been out in big winds 50 knots and uh, Fortunately, I've reefed, but as I said, with two weeks of training and, uh, and then six months later buying a boat. So that was the main list of what people voted on. There's also some other things that people mentioned, such as sinking or hitting objects in the water, which is um, apparently quite common. And some people said they suffered from anxiety from a combination of things. Um, I guess the other anxiety is really more general. It's about kind of stepping off the career ladder and taking the kids out of school, you know, are we doing the right thing? Are they getting a good education? Will I ever be able to get a job again once I get back into the real world? So they're more sort of existential sort of anxieties rather than actually specific ones about the boat. So what helps? Well, I think I'm just gonna quote what one person said because it was put so succinctly. 
they said I think it's about taking as many actions as we can to prevent ourselves getting into these situations and then knowing what we'll do if we find ourselves there. Anxiety is reduced if there's good planning and preparation beforehand where communication is happening about what needs to be done and communicating effectively if anything does actually kick off and then afterwards having a good debrief. When I was running an RYA um, sailing and racing centre we often had near misses so at the end of it we would have a debrief and then record those near misses and that would then change our risk assessment. And again when I was a volunteer crew in the RNLI before every exercise we would read through a, um, an exercise or a shout that hadn't gone so well and then we would learn from that so that we could take precaution in the exercise that we're about to do. Flight or fright syndrome is when you react emotionally to a situation. The best thing is to try and remain calm and think logically through um, the problem and how to find a solution to it, which may be easier said than done. It's not about um, looking at a situation and blaming it on someone and trying to find fault, it's more about trying to learn from that experience really. A lot of people said that having an experienced skipper really helped. If you don't feel confident about a situation yourself then it's reassuring to know that someone on the boat does. So for example reefing the sails early based on a good weather forecast or um, taking action quickly if the weather picks up so that um, you're not trying to reef the sails when it's already blowing a hoolie. We're, kind of, we're heavily reefed down but still doing sort of uh, eight and a half knots. So it's easier said than done especially if you're sleep deprived from being up in the night on anchor watch or you're doing night passages um, it doesn't help to to reduce your levels of anxiety. My suggestion really would be to grab sleep when you can. Um, it's always easier dealing with a problem when you're not sleep deprived. Um, we did three hours each, me and Woody, and um, six hours is just not enough, especially when you don't get the full six hours. So I'm gonna try and go to bed early and, and sneak another hour. The good news is that lots of people mention that these anxieties disappear when they're underway. Sometimes it's just from being out at sea, but also um, as the, pa the passage progresses and um, you build up your confidence, that can reduce your levels of anxiety. So yeah, I think often the anticipation can be worse. It's the unknown, and a lot of people agreed with this, is that you know once you've actually done it, then you can feel better after. So I hope this has been good to realise that Lots of people feel anxiety in different ways and it doesn't necessarily have to stop you going sailing or even trying it out if you've never done it before. I think maybe it is just about opening the channels of communication really and planning and preparing and debriefing so that it doesn't kind of build up inside and become a huge problem that doesn't really have to be. If anyone wants to comment or share um, about any of the subject matter then please do go to our website because now I'm uploading all the videos on the website and you can comment underneath and we can get conversations going on it because I think it's a very interesting subject. And finally, a massive big thank you to our patrons for making these videos possible. Thank you. You and me, we're family. The bond that we share is as deep as the sea. No matter how rough things may come to be, you and me, we're family, sing home. So this is a really big thank you to our patrons for pledging to Mothership Adrift and supporting us on our journey as we travel around the world. This allows us to make stories and then share these stories with you. If you want to become a patron, it's really easy. Click on the patron button and join our family in this journey around the world. And if you want to do it, do it.